We've looked at useless Halo facts two other times, but what if we looked specifically at the lore and in-game universe for the first time? This is 20 minutes of useless Halo lore information. Ready, set, go. Fist of the Unicorn is the name of a band that is consisting of members on the UNSC Pillar of Autumn in Halo Combat Evolved, though they probably all died. We see this poster promoting a show for Saturday the 23rd, though we know that the Pillar of Autumn arrives at Installation 04 on Tuesday, September 19th. The band featured specialist Von Coletta on lead guitars, with a Z, along with a replacement drummer, Private First Class Dimitrov. We don't know why they had to replace their drummer, but they did. However, their music must have been incredibly popular even after the events of Halo, because we do see that the band would have been involved in some way or another in production of the movie 117 Heroes Never Die, which we can see the poster for in Halo 5 Guardians. We don't know to what extent, whether it's surviving band members involved in it, or if they were going to use their music as like an homage to this band, it's pretty vague. However, in Halo 2 Anniversary on the campaign level, outskirts, there are posters all over the town advertising for a show of Fluke of the Narwhal, a cover band for the band Fist of the Unicorn. Kind of neat, a little homage band. In one of our Unsolved Halo mystery videos, we questioned why Guilty Spark doesn't just shoot Master Chief with his laser beam during the events of the Ma on Halo Combat Evolved. Like, he obviously doesn't want Master Chief to do the thing, and he's trying to stop him, but he doesn't do anything to stop him. We had that as an unsolved mystery, but actually there might be an answer there. And as it turns out, while Installation 04 was still a thing, Guilty Spark was tied to his protocol dictates action operations that he followed, and I guess the action wasn't to shoot him with his laser. I don't know, like, apparently that's what the lore says. In the Halo 3 level, the Ark, this might look like a giant wasteland, but technically it's a beach. We've got this like ocean over here, and there's sand, so yeah, I mean it's a beach. The Engineers, a class of Covenant enemies you fight in ODST and Reach, aren't actually living creatures. They are Forerunner computers that are created out of synthetic materials that emulate real tissue of living creatures, but they are fully non-biological. There are different types of soda in the Halo universe. There's Lemon Lime Blast Soda, which was introduced in Halo 2, Blue, Green, and Orange Soda introduced in Halo 5, there is Cola and Root Beer mentioned in Combat Evolved, there was Gauss Soda, also introduced in Halo 5, and it shows up in Infinite as well. And also, way back in the Halo 2 days, there was the Rooster Teeth Soda that showed up on the map Turf. Apparently, the map manual for Halo 2 suggests that the stone structures on the map Warlock have been transported from a different location and then rebuilt on that location on Delta Halo, though we don't know what the purpose is of that. Kat, also known as Noble 2 from Halo Reach, joined the military when she was 9 years old. She was 22 at the time of her death. That's a mind-blowing fact. In Halo 2 and 2A, players were introduced to Delta Halo, or Installation 05, for the very first time, and as far as campaigns go, the only times. Though. Halo 3's multiplayer map, Cold Storage, is the only map in Halo 3 to be set on Installation 05. Later on in Halo 5, the map Pegasus and Orion would also be set on Delta Halo as well. On the Halo Combat Evolved level, The Maw, have you ever listened to some of the techno babble that Cortana says towards the end of that level? Well, if you actually look into all the things that Cortana says on this level specifically, you could almost wonder if Cortana is purposefully maybe misleading humanity or Master Chief, or she's just really not good at predicting the outcome of certain things. Let's take a look at exactly what Cortana says. As you know, on the mod, there's the part where Fohammer comes in asking Cortana if everything was okay, and Cortana replies, negative, negative, we have a wildcat destabilization of the ship's fusion core. The engines must have sustained more damage than we thought. Uh, what do you mean more damage than we thought? But just moments before, Cortana was walking us through how to destabilize each fusion reactor, and after the engine goes critical, she says based on the current rate of decay, we should have 15 minutes to get off the ship, we don't have much time, we should move outside and signal for evac. Assessing schematics, there's a service lift at the top of the engine room, it leads to class 7 service corridor that runs along the ship's dorsal structure. But things still don't quite add up here, looking through even more dialogue that most players just kind of, I don't know, 
drink some soda or take a quick bathroom break while the cutscene's playing and not pay attention to what Cortana's saying makes this whole plan seem a lot less calculated. Because just moments before Guilty Spark showed up there, the original plan was to just use the self-destruct sequence on the Pillar of Autumn, and Cortana even says there, that should give us enough time to make it to the lifeboat and put some distance between ourselves and Halo before the detonation. I thought in Pillar of Autumn, there was only one lifeboat left, and even if there were more lifeboats, can you fly them off of a ship that's already landed somewhere? Also, if the plan was to blow up the Halo ring, why didn't Cortana put an evac out way ahead of time to maybe let the rest of the UNSC know that, hey, we're gonna be blowing this Halo ring up. Like, Fohammer just kind of got tuned in at the last second when Cortana needed a convenient ride. Was Cortana doing something sneaky here? Was she maybe still having some plot lines tied in from the original Halo plan where she was more of an antagonist? Even the black screen that pops up where it kind of gives you like the little chapter text name say hitchhikers may be escaping convicts. This actually was a really old popular theory posted on the HaloBungie.org forms by a user named Mark Simmons. And while we won't go any further into speculation territory, I really appreciate getting to kind of look at a story from a completely different angle based on lore that was presented to us in the form of literal cutscenes and game dialogue that a lot of players just kind of brushed past and was like, yeah, let's just go for it. Obviously, it doesn't matter nowadays because this story's formulated the way that it went furthermore into Halo 2 and Halo 3 and onwards. All of the speculation was pretty useless, but it was a cool reason to look closer to the lore. Also, we never actually do have 15 minutes to escape, it's always those 6 or 5 minutes. In the audio log for Sadie's story in Halo 3 ODST, Sadie experiences all 9 circles of hell as represented in Inferno written by Dante, and the prophet's species, Sanshuum, has the Latin name Perfidia Vermis, which translates to Worms of Treachery. Treachery is the ninth circle of hell in Dante's Inferno, the lowest point in hell, and the only time you see a prophet in Halo 3 ODST is at the very bottom of Data Hive at the end of the game. The company Synoviet is known for making UNSC carriers, but they also have their hands in some other businesses as well, involving technology, manufacturing generators, vehicles. They have offices in New Mombasa, Voy, and Reach to name a few, and if you ever wondered what the office building of a heavy machinery company looked like in the Halo universe, well, it looks like this. Yeah, ivory tower or reflection. It's the one building you fly in New Alexandria in that one reach level. They also have a stake in the city sewage business. So that's cool. Moas were actually real animals that lived in New Zealand until their extinction like 150 years ago. In the Halo universe, these animals were discovered upon settling the planet Reach, and since they resembled the Earth's extinct animals, they decided to name them Moas as well. O2 Henzu was a collection of stores that are in New Mombasa in different places, in Old Mombasa. I think they were just like small corner stores or convenience stores, but you can see them mostly on turf and also on the level that shares the same looking appearance district. The big tower on the Halo 2 map relic is actually part of a Forerunner vessel that is hidden below the island. The UNSC wreckage you see on the island are from surveillance team Recon 127 trying to explore the island and being shot down. In the lore, the original Halo CE map, Headlong, is set in the Section 14 district of New Mombasa, but the remake Breakneck from Halo CE Anniversary is set in the Section 21 district. The map Battle Canyon, which was featured in Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary for Reach, is confirmed to serve as some sort of array that enables teleportation across the ring, but it was never confirmed that the Battle Creek variant of the map from the original Combat Evolved had the same intentions. The map Ivory Tower once was the home of a famous sociolite named Lance O'Donnell, but was later converted into a public park. But a Apparently in the lore, Ivory Tower is not the location of the multiplayer map. The multiplayer map is a rebuild as UNSC analysts thought that the park would be a good layout for Spartan combat, and of course this shares a very strong resemblance to Synoviet Center. Hmm. In Halo 3 ODST on Oni Alpha site, there is an Oni memorial with a ton of names, and we see some interesting names of characters from the larger Halo lore, like Admiral 
Preston Cole from the Cole Protocol, Vice Admiral Michael Stanford from Fall of Reach, Dr. Catherine Halsey's here, though we do find out that she's not dead, obviously. And then there's all these other names. Also in the smaller list of names, there's an Adam Varag who only has a very small appearance in Halsey's journal, which was part of the special edition versions of Halo Reach as a special add-on item. He wrote a letter to Halsey concerning the pictograms that are commonly found on Sangheili armor. We also see the name Danforth Whitcomb, who appeared in Halo First Strike. And then this next name is probably my favorite reference that I just found out about, but Jason Morelli is listed on here, who is the father of the character Jersey from the I Love Bees story. He was, he was this guy in the little illustration animation I'd made for that video a couple years ago. Oh, yeah, also there's a London Bridges. Yeah. <laughs> Franks Formed Fish. It's a brand of fish products that have existed in the Halo universe. They have several kinds of processed fish products, including nuggets, fish tacos, and fish pies. And their logo looks like this. And is it a fish? Is it a whale? Well, you decide. It's a quote from Luke Smith back during the Bungie podcast days. It's been about a year since I personally made a discovery in Halo lore. And while there is Halopedia articles talking about different headlines that show up on newspapers across Halo games, no one ever found this one that I found in Coastal Highway, possibly. At least I haven't still seen anyone talk about it other than since my post was made on Twitter. But yeah, it's a newspaper article that says Grunt adopts a baby and you can see a baby crawling with a pacifier and a grunt. Still a little sad that there's not an exclusive Halopedia page written about this specific newspaper article. <laughs> I wasn't sure if Luke and I were the first people to discover this, but if you literally type in Grunt Adopts Baby on Google, the only thing that shows up is my tweet about it a year ago. In the official Halo lore canon, this picture was photographed by the character Benjamin Gerode, who is a photojournalist in the Hunt the Truth audio story log thing they did. It's actually a really good audio story if you haven't listened to it. But yeah, it's just funny to think that the photographer took this picture of Master Chief. Also, during that story, he ends up getting a notice of violation for causing some issues on a flight. And if you look at the actual notice of violation, you can see that the officer name was O'Connor, who gave him the citation. So far in the Halo franchise, there's only a handful of Halo rings that haven't been directly observed or used in a plot within the Halo lore, with the exception of the Halo 3 plot where all of the rings were maybe going to be activated at the same time. But these Halo rings that haven't been a central location or plot point are Beta Halo Installation 01, which is the furthest Halo ring away from all the other ones, Epsilon Halo, which is Installation 02, which may be a water or icy themed Halo ring. We haven't seen any gameplay on the surface of Installation 03 Gamma Halo, though it is that Halo ring that shows up in Halo 4's story, and apparently the UNSC has been doing stuff on the and so had the Didact and like the rest of the Covenant led by Jewel Mandama, but we never actually get to see any of that in game. So this one doesn't count, but it is worth noting. Installation 4 is the one from Combat Evolved, also known as Alpha Halo. Installation 5 is the one from Halo 2, known as Delta Halo. Then there's Installation 6, known as Kappa Halo, which we've never seen before. And then Installation 7 is Zeta Halo, the one featured in Halo Infinite. Installation 08 is the replacement to 04 that popped up at the end of Halo 3. And then there's an Installation 09 that had a little plot in Halo Wars 2 that would have been the replacement to Installation. On the Halo Reach level reflection, we can actually see some more sodas that we haven't seen before, like the Purple Concoction, Bitter Brown, Red Hotness, Blueberry Blue, Green Sour, the Blackness, and Water. There are different types of drop pods that the UNSC use, also known as Single Occupant Exo-Atmospheric Insertion Vehicles. Some of these have windows and some of them don't have windows on them. Also, there's a special variant known as Long Range Stealth Orbital Insertion Pods, which is pretty cool. When the Flood attacked the Forerunner planet DM3-1123b, only about 0.006% of the planetary population was evacuated, meaning only 1,361,466 individuals out of the 226.911 billion survived. We learned that one in a 
Halo 3 terminal. There's a character known as UNSC Navy Lieutenant Jagger that served under Jacob Keys in 2552 and was known for being moody and drinking on duty. Yikes. The average height of a Sanghealy is between 7 foot 4 inches to 8 feet 6 inches or 225 to 262 centimeters and the average weight is between 307 to 393 pounds or 139 to 178 kilograms. Though across multiple games, while it may seem like there are some lore discrepancies in the height of the elites, this is actually explained by just different posture of elites that are encountered. Like, for instance, in Scale to Master Chief, while in Combat Evolved Anniversary, the elites look a little bit shorter. They really just have their necks prolonged and hunched over more. Halo Reach did a pretty good job, though. This terminal in Halo 2 Anniversary reveals that the Arbiter, during his time as the Supreme Commander dude, before he was the Arbiter, he was responsible for over 1 billion human casualties, which is also a result of the loss of at least 7 human planets. And, apparently, he also destroyed over 123 human vessels and resulted in the deaths of over 23,000 UNSC personnel. So that's a pretty good kill-death ratio, if you ask me. I always love some of the little odds and ends and detail things we get out of some of the books that aren't massive plot points but fill in gaps that don't really need to be filled in but there they are. Like in Halo Bad Blood, it actually fills in the few moments after the final cutscene of Halo 5 Guardians where Master Chief finally reunites with the Arbiter and we kind of just get this cool little nod in the cutscene like yeah they're gonna do stuff together in the next game. But what really happens is after this in the books, they have a celebratory meal and Master Chief introduces his blue team friends to his friend the Arbiter and then they decide to go head to the Infinity together as a group. Thanks Halo Bad Blood for filling in the gap of a celebratory meal that we never knew happened here. Okay, this next one may be a little bit wild, but it goes pretty deep. It always bothered me a little bit at the end of Halo 3, in the cutscene where Master Chief is driving the Warthog and him and Arbiter are in the little like parking garage and they're like, yeah, we totally made it. And Arbiter runs off to it with the controls, Chief goes and plugs Cortana in so she can hit the engine and they can start flying out of there right away. But why didn't Cortana just close the garage door in the process of all that? I mean, surely Cortana who has the ability to just activate the engines instantly and fly the ship right out of there while Arbiter starts to, you know, get into the steering position and all of that, has the ability to close the garage door. It's almost like she wants Master Chief to just fly out of the back of the ship. So I thought maybe this could be another example theory of Cortana maybe being evil, but if we look closer to the lore here, or just the things that we see in the games itself, this actually isn't a lore discrepancy or bad writing for Cortana. It's just something else. The reason why, canonically speaking, in the Halo lore, Cortana cannot close this garage door to stop Master Chief from nearly getting hit by a tank and stopping all the vehicles from just flying out of the back of the ship, is because the Forward Unto Dawn and other ships like the Forward Unto Dawn just don't have a garage door on it or a back door. They just fly these things all over the place with this giant open door in the back and they store their vehicles there and apparently they don't fall out. We actually looked into this during a live stream and started to have these revelations on stream where we're breaking down trying to figure out why the garage door couldn't be closed by Cortana and it's not Cortana's fault. She literally can't close the door because there is no door. Look, when they come and deliver you the vehicles in the level of the Ark, it's this little elevator thing that drops down, but sure enough, you can see the back door is just open there. And then, if you watch the cutscene at the end of the storm, you can see that these babies just go into this huge firefight with their little door open in the back. How do they stop all of these boxes and vehicles from flying out every single time they fly literally anywhere? I don't know. But here's what we do know. This ship was designed by Synoviet, the same company that has that weird building in Reach. They apparently have the sewers of Bazaar in Halo Infinite down, and in my opinion, 
are not very good at designing certain aspects of their ships. So somehow we've come full circle on this video. Also, please come hang out with me on Twitch sometimes. I'm probably streaming really late at night, but you know, if you're not sleeping or you're awake during those hours, just come hang out twitch.tv forward slash rocket sloth. I'm usually speedrunning ODST acrophobia and talking about some nonsensical Halo things, so go ahead and follow so you get notifications when I stream. And as always, a huge shout out to our patrons. You guys are amazing supporting our channel, supporting content like this where we can make 20 minutes of useless lore information. Thank you to everybody who has pledged even just a couple of dollars helping support our channel or you know every single dollar counts so if you want to help our channel out and make a pledge today we can continue to make content like this and more things in the future uh there's a link in the description to that too thanks so much for watching we'll see you guys next time with a new video